Where the land and ocean meet, one will often find a beach of some sort. The actions of waves and tides lead to an accumulation of sediment in such places. The sediment particles might be relatively large stones, small pebbles, sand grains, or some combination. These particles may also vary considerably in color based upon their mineral composition. Still, for all this variety, it is fairly easy to recognize such a place. Typically, when walking along a sandy beach, two things tend to become readily apparent. First, the place feels empty compared to the ground further inland. There are no plants to speak of, and the animals often appear to be merely passing through. Second, there is often a fair amount of rather inert material washed up from the sea. One might easily find seashells in the sand, provided the place hasn't been picked clean by human visitors. Driftwood is also common in at least some places. Alas, more unpleasant garbage isn't all that uncommon either these days. Setting aside the man-made stuff, most of what washes up on a sandy shore may be regarded as remains of some sort. The pale, skeletal remnants of mollusks and echinoderms, the bleached, polished fragments of former trees, and other such things. From this point of view, the beach might seem almost like a strange sort of graveyard. Of course, the place isn't quite so lifeless as it might appear to be. Depending on the precise location, there may be quite a variety of creatures present. However, they are often out of sight, buried within the sand. Bivalves are a common example of this, with only a small hole in the wet sand giving away their presence at low tide. While some creatures are large enough to be readily visible when dug out of the sand, there are a multitude of microscopic forms of life as well. These don't exactly burrow in the sand as their larger counterparts do. To a clam or a heart urchin, the sand is merely a coarse medium to travel through. To these tiny creatures, it is a realm in its own right. After all, many of them are smaller than the individual sand grains, so to them, the environment is a shifting labyrinth of large crystalline boulders. Perhaps not the easiest place to live, but there are many forms of life that manage quite well. As it turns out, below the high tide mark at least, a sandy beach is often teeming with life, hiding away between the sand grains. Such life is not restricted to beaches, of course, and it can be found in sediments throughout the world's oceans. Whether it's a sandy shore or the mud of the abyssal plain, there is often a surprising amount of this miniature animal life lurking between the sediment particles. It is so abundant and so widespread, it has a number of specific names. The most commonly used of these names are the myobenthos and the myofauna. For the sake of clarity, it is important to define an approximate size range for these little creatures. A millimeter is a familiar enough unit of measure, being one thousandth of a meter. There is another unit, the micrometer, or micron for short, that is one thousandth of a millimeter. Roughly speaking, typical myofauna range between about a millimeter and about 50 micrometers, or 0.05 millimeters. To add a bit of context, sand is generally defined as mineral grains between 2 and 0.0625 millimeters. Or, in other words, anything between a little over 60 microns and about 2,000 microns. So, the myofauna found in a sandy beach are generally at least a little smaller than the surrounding sand grains, and sometimes quite a bit smaller. Now, these myofauna are not alone in their miniature world. After all, wherever there is animal life, there must be something for the animals to consume. In marine sediments, there is often some amount of detritus, little particles of decaying organic matter from various sources. It is not uncommon to find bacteria and other microbes feeding on this detritus, along with some of the myofauna. Sometimes these microbes are food for the myofauna as well. In shallower waters, like those found on the lower end of a beach, it is also possible to find several sorts of photosynthetic algal life. Diatoms and dinoflagellates would be a couple of common examples. These things often end up on the myofauna menu as well. As for the creatures themselves, there is a remarkable variety. A complete exhaustive survey would take hours, so let us instead consider just a few of the major groups. Some of these groups are found mainly or entirely within the world's oceans. However, there are quite a few that have species found in freshwater or soil, as well as the marine species. One sort of creature that is widespread and yet often overlooked is the gastrotrich. 
The name roughly translates into stomach hair, which refers to the many cilia these little creatures use to glide slowly over available surfaces. They are cousins to the considerably larger flatworms, and seem to live mainly as generalist omnivores, sucking up whatever detritus and microbes they happen across. Many species are found in fresh water, and a few exist in damp soil and moss mats. Of course, quite a few varieties can also be found in the ocean. Most either live on or within various sediments, and the marine species can be found as parts of the myofauna more or less worldwide. Another surprisingly commonplace group that is often overlooked is the rotifers. These creatures are within the clade Nathifera, which includes several other strange, obscure groups like Ketonaths and Micronathozoans. The majority of known rotifer species are found in freshwater, though they are also frequently found in moss samples. There are a few marine groups as well, though. The genus Proales would be one example. The general rotifer body plan includes a mouth at the front, with a corona bearing numerous cilia used for feeding and sometimes locomotion. Just inside the mouth, there is a chewing organ known as the mastax. Behind this is a stomach, inside a somewhat expanded body. This body tapers back into a foot that usually has two toes. There is a considerable variety in rotifer forms, within the constraints of the basic body plan. At a glance, it seems like the marine varieties have less prominent coronas and somewhat more squat bodies, but this is by no means a certainty. Wherever one finds rotifers, it is likely that one will also find tardigrades. These creatures, also known as water bears, are cousins to the arthropods. The basic body plan is a squat, somewhat pudgy little animal with eight limbs. Each limb has several prominent claws at its end. A pair of eye spots is sometimes present, and the mouth parts generally form a sucking apparatus for draining fluids from individual cells. As with rotifers, most of the known tardigrade species are found in places like freshwater, soil, and moss. Some species seem to be particularly fond of moss, and another name for tardigrades is moss piglets. Marine tardigrades seem to be a little different from their more well-known relatives. In many cases, the head is adorned with a number of prominent spines. The claws at the end of the eight limbs are sometimes oddly spoon-shaped with expanded tips. One example of this body plan can be seen in the genus Batalipes, but this is only one out of several marine genera. One especially successful group found in microhabitats throughout the world is the nematodes. The body plan here is very simple and straightforward. It is a worm, enclosed in a tough cuticle that is shed from time to time as the creature grows. Simple enough, though the vermiform shape might be, it is ideal for moving through sediments and other tight spaces. The phylum Nematoda contains half a million species by some estimates. If this is accurate, the only larger animal phylum would be the arthropods. Amusingly enough, the nematodes and arthropods are fairly close relatives, as they are both found within the clade Ecdysozoa. This clade encompasses the various animal phyla that produce external cuticles that are regularly shed. Much like the arthropods, nematodes can be found pretty much everywhere. They are particularly abundant in soil and similar environments. Some are notorious parasites. As it turns out, quite a few can be found in marine sediments. In fact, they are some of the most commonly encountered myofauna and often outnumber the other myofauna in the community. The other particularly common form of myofauna is a variety of arthropod. More specifically, it is a type of crustacean. More specifically still, it is a sort of copepod. Copepods are well-known components of oceanic plankton, with a wide variety of shapes and often overwhelming population sizes. Yet, not all copepods drift through the water. One group in particular, the order Harpactoida, consists of copepods that are adapted to a more benthic existence. While some species are found in freshwater, most are found in the ocean. A few species are planktonic, but the majority live in various ocean sediments throughout the world. A typical harpactoid copepod has an elongated shape with a pair of antennae at the front and a pair of sensory appendages at the back. Several short, bristly legs are also tucked away beneath the body, generally towards the front. Such appendages might not be much good for swimming, but they seem quite effective for moving through the narrow gaps between sand grains. The last two myofunnel groups of particular note are also ecdysozoans. They are both found only in marine environments and exist within the clade known as the Scalidophora. 
This name essentially means scalid bearers. The scalids in question are specialized spines, typically found on what roughly amounts to the head or perhaps a part of the mouth. The first of these two groups is the Kynorynx, commonly known as mud dragons. The name Kynorynx roughly translates into moving snout, which does describe their behavior to an extent. Each Kynorynx is a small, generally oblong creature without any limbs, apart from a couple of short tails at its posterior end. At the front of the body, there is a complicated structure sometimes known as the introvert. It is so named because it can be introverted or tucked away inside the body. This introvert includes a mouth cone bearing several oral stylets, basically a little ring of needles. Behind this is an array of recurved spines, the scalids. These scalids are used for locomotion. In other words, the creature drags itself through its surroundings using what amounts to a spiny, mobile snout. As a small aside, I couldn't help but notice an odd convergence in some of the body plans while I was researching this particular topic. Now this is by no means a universal trend. The nematodes and tardigrades are exceptions, as is the last group to be discussed shortly. That said, when looking at the kynorynchs, the harpactoid copepods, the marine rotifers, and the gastrotrix side by side, a distinct pattern seems to emerge. A roughly oblong body with a few bristles at the front and two little tails of some sort at the back. When the same basic form is seen across several unrelated groups, it often means something. Perhaps this body pattern is especially good for moving through an environment of sediment particles of similar or greater size to the creature in question. Then again, maybe it's just an odd coincidence. The last group of myofauna we'll be looking at for today is the Lorisiferans. Very roughly, the name translates into something like armor bearers. In a general sense, the lorica is a form of armor. Indeed, the word is essentially Latin for body armor, referring to something like a cuirass or a hauberk. In the case of the lorisiferans, the lorica is a protective outer covering that encases most of the body. It looks almost like a little bowl or basket. Within this lorica is the rest of the creature. Like the Kynorynx, the Lorisiferans have an introvert with a mouth and associated stylets at the front and a series of various types of scalids further back. This structure can be withdrawn and extended, though the Lorisiferan isn't nearly so mobile as the Kynorynx. In fact, most of the time, these creatures anchor themselves quite firmly to sand grains. Apparently, the only reliable way to persuade them to let go involves immersing them in fresh water, which unfortunately has the side effect of killing them. So that has made their study a bit more difficult. One might wonder just why these creatures are so thoroughly committed to clinging onto the sand. One possible reason may be easily illustrated by a rather unusual sort of crustacean. It is not at all uncommon to find little crabs on beaches. One type in particular is known as the sand bubbler crab, with several species found in the genus Dotilla and the genus Scopomera. These little crustaceans are generally about a centimeter across when fully grown and found on tropical beaches in certain parts of the world. At a glance, they might seem almost cute to us. To the local myofauna, each one is a walking apocalypse. They are known for a very particular behavior. At high tide, these crabs retreat into burrows they've excavated into the sand. When the tide goes out, they emerge and immediately begin scooping sand up into their mouths. Their mouth parts are adorned with extensive bristles that form a sieve of sorts. They sieve out potential bits of food, including many of the myofauna, and consume them, leaving a little ball of compacted sand behind. While the tide is out, each crab repeats this process over and over, accumulating a collection of sandy little spheroids all around its burrow entrance. Eventually, when the tide comes back in, these tiny shapes are washed away. By this time, the crab is safely back in its burrow, out of reach of the potential predators that are now swimming in the waters above it. It is just possible that the Lorisiferans adhere so closely to the sand grains in order to escape such depredations. Not necessarily just the sand bubbler crabs, but any sort of creature that sieves through the sediment and discards the leftover sand before ingestion. In such a case, one might expect the free-living creatures like Kynorynx to meet their demise, while the Lorisiferans are spat out along with their attached sand grains. 
The Mayo fauna are a strange assemblage of creatures that inhabit a world quite alien to our own, yet they seem to manage quite well overall. So if you should find yourself on a sandy beach sometime in the future, maybe spare a glance towards the wet sand. Perhaps, just for a moment, consider the hidden multitudes of minuscule creatures quietly going about their lives well beneath our notice. Thank you for listening. I hope you have enjoyed this brief glimpse into the more unusual side of the natural world. If you wish to know more, here are a few things that might be worth looking into. If you found this enjoyable, feel free to leave a like. If you think others would enjoy this content, by all means, share. If you have something to say or ask about, honest comments are always welcome. If you wish to see more from this channel, a subscription would be most helpful. Until next time.